Hello, and welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I'm your host, Brian Broom, filling in for Emily Maxson, and I'm joined today by Greg Uttinger. Today, we are continuing our march through uh, ancient church history Ooh. and discussing the consequences of uh, David's sin with Bathsheba and, well, the sin with Bathsheba as well, and what comes about as a result. So, Greg, why don't you start us off? Well, we were just talking before the podcast about how long the story is because it begins in 2 Samuel 11 and pretty much goes toward the end of the book. Uh, this is this is a long, long story with lots of intricate details. It would do justice to any TV soap opera. Unfortunately, this is real, and it involves one of God's most precious servants, which makes it all the more distressing and sobering for us. Most people know the story, at least in its broad outlines. Uh, it's a time of war, but David has stayed behind in the palace, gets up off his bed in the middle of the day. What was he doing there? And looks out the window and sees a young woman. It's unclear. She's washing herself. It's unclear whether that's a bath or whether she's doing some kind of ceremonial pur uh, purification. Doesn't matter. He shouldn't have looked. He should have turned away. Instead, he asks, who is this? And someone, a palace servant, says, this is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliab, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. In other words, this is the granddaughter of one of your mighty men, the wife of one of your mighty men. Whatever you're thinking, Read between you the lines probably here. shouldn't. <laughs> you probably shouldn't do it. It's like and, there's a line from uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox. Mm -hmm. If what I think is going on is going on, it better not be. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> but the servant uh, didn't have the courage to push any further. David sins for her and commits adultery with her. Now, backing up here a second. So she's the granddaughter of one of his mighty men, one of his elite bodyguards. Or warriors, the wife of another, and something this doesn't say here, but we learn elsewhere, and her grandfather is a man named Ahithophel, who was one of David's chief counselors, who speaks with uh, impeccable wisdom on all occasions. David's managing to alienate a lot of people here, because it's not like, I guess his assumption is no one will know, which has got to be one of the stupidest assumptions anyone can ever make in these matters. And, uh, and then the other, of course, the other stupid assumption is, and of course she won't get pregnant. Well, she gets pregnant and sins and tells David. Bathsheba is uh, a full generation younger than David and perhaps more. David's around 50. She may be around 20. She grew up in and about the palace with her dad and then the man who became her husband. She knew David as her king, her hero, the Lord's Messiah, the anointed one, the, the, the savior of Israel. And when he calls and says, it's all right, I'm a prophet, I know these things, trust me. Nathan the prophet will compare this to taking your neighbor's little ewe lamb as a pet and killing it and eating it. Uh, certainly Bathsheba is responsible for her sins, but God's judgment throughout is uh, pointed at David. He did great evils, two capital crimes before we're done, because when she says, I'm pregnant. David calls her husband back from the front, tries to get him drunk so he'll go and sleep with his wife. That doesn't work. Twice it doesn't work. And so he sends a message to his uh, field commander and says, arrange for his death. And Joab, the field commander, his general, does so. And lest we misunderstand, the writer says, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Mm. Well, the prophet Nathan comes and does his little parable, and David does repent. To his honor and to the glory of God, he repents. But this begins a series of tragedies. Uh, the penalty for theft is fourfold restitution. When Nathan had done his, his parable of it, it's just like taking this guy's little lamb and sacrificing and eating it. David is outraged, thinking the prophet's talking about someone else, and says, the man who did this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold because he did this thing and had no pity. Okay, David, you just pronounced the penalty. You killed one. You're going to lose four before the story is over. And it actually does bleed into 
first kings, he's going to lose four sons. First of all, the baby dies. It's not the baby's fault. No, it's not. When we sin, when we sin horribly. It's normally, it's not always us who bears the penalty. No, not no, us alone. Not us alone. There's collateral damage. And sometimes uh, it is, it's harder when we see our children suffering for our sins than if we had to suffer ourselves. Uh, we, we don't want our sins to touch our children, but the process has begun. Not too long after, and this is chapter 13, David has two older boys. One is named Absalom by one wife, and um, the other is named Amnon by another wife. There, David has multiple wives. This is wrong, and he knows it. And the law said don't do this, but he's done it because kings did those things. Uh, that's and exactly God, what... They were told what Israel was told would happen when yeah. when they accepted a king other than other than the Lord is that they're going to take your young men for chariot riders and mm -hmm. they will multiply into themselves wives and and hoard well, resources I guess <laughs> gold and silver you know it this is exactly even though David is the man after God's own heart and he is a archetype so to speak of Christ a shadow he is still part of the consequence for Israel that they rejected the Lord as their king. Yeah. And, and so he has these, these wives. And of course, as in all harems, there's competition, jockeying for power and favoritism. So these boys already don't like each other a whole lot. But Absalom has a sister named Tamar, who's beautiful, apparently sweet girl. And Amnon, the brother, uh, half-brother, has developed uh, an insane lust toward her. And uh, he confesses this to his friend, a cousin, a man named Jonadab. And Jonadab, is so, throughout this whole story, is sort of like the serpent in Eden. He's called a very subtle man, and that should be a hint. He keeps coming up with great plans that are horrible. <laughs> he says, um, uh, you know what? Why don't you pretend you're sick and your dad will come visit you? And then you can ask that uh, Tamar be the one to nurse you. Which already then, sends up the weirdest red flag. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and, and, but David completely doesn't catch it and uh, agrees to it and sends Tamar to be slaughtered in her own way. Ammon gets her alone, uh, tries to seduce her, and then flat out rapes her. And she goes home. Uh, Absalom, her brother, sees what's happened and tries to comfort her. But at that point, he's decided, well, that's it for Amnon, then he's dead. And he waits a couple of years, probably to come of age, and uh, throws a great feast. And he tries to get David to come and all the king's son, and David's busy and puts him off. And it's just the slightest bit curious. Why do you want all the king's sons there? But he doesn't follow through. He doesn't pursue. And Absalom instructs his servants, when Amnon is merry and drinking, kill him. I'll give the signal, you kill him, and they do. And Absalom runs away. And David is very, very upset. And yet in the midst of all of this, he doesn't do much of anything. When he hears about the uh, the rape, the text says, when David, when King David heard of it, all these things, he was very wroth. That's it. He got really angry. He's the king. He's the he has authority. Judge. Yeah. Not just well, as a father, but as a king. It, it's an example of how you can't you can't let your familial connections prevent justice. Yeah. If you are in a position of authority to mete out justice, you can't let blood relation hold sway. And we we see this, I think. Uh, somewhat often in like church discipline situations. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Just uh, and I'm I'm not even I'm not even an elder or a deacon or in any kind of church leadership position, <laughs> and I I have heard more stories than I can count of things like this. Yeah, and I am an elder, and I've had to work through things like this, and of course I can give no details. Yeah. Uh, with regard to the, our Christian school, I've seen this as well. People who will. Press for the letter of the law and for justice when it's someone else's kid, but the moment it's their kid, oh no, mercy, oh no, school rules don't apply. It happened off campus. Oh, no. mm. this, this is not helping anybody. And uh, it, it, it even is something to consider when 
you're not not even when you're just talking about blood relation within the church, but also just someone within the church at all and making excuses for them. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah, well, it, doesn't, what, it doesn't work. <laughs> what will the what will the world say if this comes out? We'll lose our testimony. Well, uh, well the testimony <laughs> was already lost. Yeah, yeah. is the thing, and, and uh, you just add to it if you don't address it and you don't involve the civil authority when it actually warrants it. Obviously, yeah. um, anyway. cases of, uh, of uh, child molestation, and unfortunately, I am aware of them not in my current church, but in other places and times. And I have seen that as an excuse. Well, we've, the guy's sorry. He cried a lot. Uh, no need to destroy him further. No need to tarnish the reputation of his family. His family will be humiliated when this comes out. The church and the test, their testimony, the, the reputation of Christ will be damaged. Let's just sweep it under the carpet. I'm sure he's sorry. I'm sure I've never heard again. It'll happen again. And Let's just quietly ch- move him from this pa- parish to a different one, and exactly. everything will be fine as long everything as we don't acknowledge will be it. Fine, you know, failure to deal with it. And in some ways, that's what this this discussion is about. Um, it, and I think it becomes clear in this one line: he, David got angry. He should have done a whole lot more. We, we can ask ourselves why. We've suggested some some reasons here. I would throw on top of that a rather obvious suggestion: is that David looked back at his own sin. He had he had committed adultery. He had that's, virtually raped Bathsheba. That's what I was thinking of as well. Is that it, it? It becomes very hard for someone to punish others for the same sin that they are yeah. guilty of, which is one of the reasons that a requirement for eldership is to be a man above reproach. Right. It's not the only reason why that's in there, but it's one of them. One of the reasons. Yeah. It's. Uh... No one said that the job of being an elder or a magistrate, a judge, whatever, is an easy one. And sometimes it is necessary to recuse oneself and back off and say, I, I'm too close to this. And, you know, in every cop show I've seen lately, there's always, you, you have to back off. You have to put yourself off duty on this because you're too close. No, <laughs> that's why I'm, I'm personally involved. I have to see this through. It's, no, you really don't. Yeah, somebody else can do this. You can... You can trust the people you work with. You may be the star on listed as the star in the credits, but your character <laughs> really shouldn't be doing this. And somehow it's kind of ennobling that uh, you stay there and fight it out because you're closer to things. Uh, then if you're closer, then you know you can give evidence, you can give testimony, and you can help find out the truth, and you can console those who've been hurt. But there's a time for the judges to step back, or if they're not going to, then they have to follow through. Yeah. If David is not going to uh, exercise judgment here, then he could back off and say, "Elders, this is outside my purview. It's too close to home. I turn him over to you." Next, next tie is on the chain of command. Investigate. Come to a solution. Yeah. Whatever it is, I'll back you. Uh, yeah, well, I try to get my house in it's, order. It's not the seating of authority. It's the I can't be the one to make the decision, but you're gonna, you're gonna, your decision will bear the weight of my authority behind it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but this this problem of of guilt feelings based on a once upon a time real guilt. I broke the law. I've since repented. It's covered by the blood of Christ. But I still have that consciousness that once I did this, and if I did this, how can I hold someone else accountable? Uh, and and it's, a, it's a very hard thing. And yet that doesn't, the fact that it's, life is hard, responsibility is hard, being a father is hard, being a king is hard, being an elder, a pastor is hard. You either have to be willing to follow through or you have to have the wisdom to turn it over to someone else and then stay out of the way and quit kibitzing. Stop trying to take it back. I've seen that too. Mm. Well, uh, why don't you guys take care of her? Oh, and I changed my mind because I don't like what you're doing. I'll take it back and we'll something. No, you can't. This doesn't work. Um, Let your yes be yes and your no be no. <laughs> yeah. Well, the story goes on. Uh, Absalom has fled back to his father's kingdom because he was the son of a, uh, or his mom was the son of a king elsewhere. And David David misses his son. And I'm trying to catch up to where we are in the text of scripture. We're told that uh, this is the tale of 13. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur. He was there three years. And the soul of King David longed to go forth into Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Adam, seeing he was dead. <laughs> I'm not sure what to make of that, but it doesn't, <clears throat> doesn't exactly 
Yeah. He merely misses Absalom and wants to go to it, but again, doesn't do anything. And Amnon, well, he's dead. Yeah. Uh, eventually. It's in the past. <laughs> eventually, Joab, the, the general who was responsible for the murder of Uriah directly, the one who ordered him into battle where he would get killed, sees that David is sad and there's strain on the family. He's, he's a cousin in all of this. So he arranges. Uh, and I won't go through the whole story. He arranges for a reunion eventually. He gets, he kind of sort of almost, but not quite tricks David into admitting that David's gone too far. And David's solution is, all right, fine, bring him home, but we'll do, we'll do exile in town. He can be in town, close, but he won't see my face, which is not much of a solution. No. Uh, eventually, Absalom pushes for true resolutions is let him come. I want to see him. If I'm worthy of death, he should kill me. Otherwise, this needs to end. Out of the mouth of um, <clears throat> babes and murderers, um, it's a very probably, interesting probably, uh, yeah. statement <clears throat> to make. Yeah, probably Absalom's defense is, my guess is what I would go for, for lack of any other. I hated his guts, so I killed it. It's not, it doesn't work. Uh, probably he's claiming the right of kinsman redeemer. Avenger of blood. He he raped my daughter and or my sister, and therefore, but you know what? Rape is a single rape was not in and of itself a death penalty. You could argue that this one was because it wasn't seduction; it was violent, and that's probably what Absalom claimed. Right. And if that's so, then he should have had his day in court. He could argue his case, and the king or a judge should pa pass sentence in terms of such logic. The kinsman redeemer rule did that apply? to any thing or was, I thought it was only for yeah. accidental death. <laughs> See, that's the thing. He would have to argue it in court and say, but look, we can extend the principle to, it's not, it's certainly not open and shut. In fact, the one, the one precedent we have, Levi and Simeon going into the town Shechem and slaughtering everybody because one boy had raped their sister. Which is then, also not <laughs> looked on well by God. <laughs> no, God did not give his sanction to that either. So it, it's, and and it, probably the reason that David avoided it is because he, 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 you know, as a parent, as an elder, as someone who loves your friends, your family, you stay up late thinking of all the rationales, trying to rationalize a solution, get the, figure out the solution you want, and then try to explain it in terms of God's law. We can be very creative. I think I've been guilty of this more than a few times, of walking through things, of, well, this, 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 and this. <clears throat> but time comes along and says, that's the stupidest exegesis and logic I've ever heard. Like, <clears throat> kind, yeah. kind of on that same uh, train of thought, I was just remembering or thinking about it earlier today, the whole, um, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye mm -hmm. of a needle than for a rich man to enter to heaven. And yeah. then, People didn't like that, so they were like, well, there was a gate in Jerusalem called yeah. the Eye of the Needle, which never existed. <laughs> they, just, they just came up with something. It's like, yeah. it's, I mean, you don't even need to say you can't be rich because the passage isn't saying that. It's just that no. riches were a, a, an apparent sign of blessing to the yeah. Jewish people. And Anyway, I'm, I'm getting off track, but same kind of idea. It's like you can yeah. come up with any kind of ridiculous argument you want. It doesn't mean that mm -hmm. it's right. Yeah. Uh, but it is interesting that Absalom pushes for some kind of resolution, and David gives in and invites Absalom to come see him. He came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground, and the king kissed Absalom. But the immediate consequence of the next chapter, after this it came to pass that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the gate of the way, and it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, that Absalom called Unto him and said, What city art thou? And he said, I serve as one of the tribes of Israel. Absalom said, Unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. And Absalom said, More, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which had any suit or cause might come to me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Ooh. So Absalom gets restored to favor. He got what he wanted. And you know what? 
didn't satisfy. Dad was a jerk. Dad's a rotten king. Look, look how he handled it. He bungled everything. Yes, he should have executed you, but that's something else. You know, you know, the Israel deserves a better king than David. He deserves, well, me. And so he develops a very subtle plan to usurp the, the, the throne. He, he hangs out at court. And, you know, when, when people come away from a court decision, one party is usually going to be dissatisfied. And so whenever it was someone from, not from the tribe of Judah, which was very little to David, but from one of the other Sid tribes of Israel, uh, Absalom would go up, and um, as the king's son, they people would normally do him homage, but he does homage to them, kisses them, greets them, asks about what's going on, and says, yeah, you're, oh, you're, you're so right, your cause was so just, it's rotten, that there's nobody qualified to judge you, I mean, you're, even if someone were deputed to, to handle cases like this, to do a better job of this. Oh, that I were judge. He doesn't say king. Oh, that I were judge in Israel. I would make this right. And meanwhile, he's hired chariots and horses and foot runners to put on an outward show. And he does this for some time. And it says he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Very deliberate plan. And eventually, when he's ready, and when he has people in place in the conspiracy, including Bathsheba's grandfather, Hethophel, he announces his kingship. Word reaches David, the hearts of the men of Israel after Absalom. And David said, arise, flee. So at this point, David had a choice. He was in Jerusalem. Absalom had, been, had announced his, uh, his accession elsewhere. David could have stayed, fortified Jerusalem, and fought it out. He might have won. He could have summoned Judah to his side. It might have worked. It would have been a horribly bloody civil war. And Jerusalem might have suffered severe damage or siege. But David looks on this as in some sense his fault. Now, Absalom's the one who's rebelling. Absalom's the one who's trying to topple the monarchy. Absalom's the one who's disregarding God's covenant with David. So it's, it's not strictly speaking David's fault, but David set in motion things or failed to set in motion things that would stop this. He had not dealt with his family. And so David David flees, and he is taking with him those he needs and those who are most loyal to him. Interestingly, his uh, Philistine bodyguard, the people who had, come, who had come to faith in the God of Israel while he was in the land of Philistia, uh, they want to go with him. The priests want to go. <clears throat> and this, I think, is, is a very a key moment in David's decisions. As, as palace folk are flocking out of the gates and going down over the Rakhidron, across the Mount of Olives, a familiar journey later. The priest come with the ark. <laughs> and, and, and David says, no, 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 you, you take it back. I will go into exile. The ark stays here with God's people. And if God is pleased with me, one day he'll bring me back to see it again. But I will go into exile and the ark will remain. And, and this, this is major. Here we have, and, and the, that it happens as he crosses the Bokhidon, Kedron, and goes up the Mount of Olives, which is probably where the cross stood. It's where Isaac had been offered centuries before. Here he lives out, uh, again, in the image of Christ. Yeah. He takes upon himself exile for a crime that was not his, so that God's presence can continue with his people. Uh, this is true humility. It's, Not uh, to mention he's he's sort of um, imaging the the scapegoat that is mm, sent into the wilderness as well. Sent into the wilderness, yeah, yeah. Okay, he's taking it. He's taking all the blame. He's taking it upon himself. Absalom arrives with his army, his followers, and assumes control. Now, one of the last people who wanted to go with David was not allowed to. Is a man named Hushai. Seems to be an older guy. He's certainly not a warrior because David says, if you came with me, you'd only be a hindrance. But you stay here and you pretend to be on Absalom's side. And uh, maybe you can defeat the council of this Ahithophel because Ahithophel is a brilliant man. He's going to tell him stuff that's just absolutely going to destroy us. Maybe God will use you to do something. So he agrees. Well, when Absalom arrives... Um, Hushai goes up and, oh, God, save the king. God, save, save the king. What are you doing here? Why didn't you go with your friend? Oh, um, no, but uh, but whom the Lord and this people and all the men of Israel choose, his I will be, 
and with him will I abide. Again, whom should I should I serve? Shall I not serve in the presence of his son as I've served in the father's presence? So will I be in thy presence. You can read between the lines there a little bit. Whoever God makes king, yeah, we know who God made king. So it's, it's um, yeah. And Absalom, now Absalom had it all figured out to this point. And he's done, he's hard, he really has not made a mistake anywhere. Uh, he did bank on David running away, probably. But at this point, he's suddenly, okay, uh, wow, I'm in charge. I got what I wanted. What do I do now, guys? And he turns to Ahithophel and Hushai. And Hushai isn't ready for this one. He doesn't have an immediate, well, what you should do. Ahithophel says, oh, it's easy. Uh, your father left some of his concubines behind to tend the house. Now, again, concubine is not mistress. These were lawful wives who came in without dowry. So they are, were originally poor girls that David romanced and took into his harem. But they are legitimate wives. And so, insofar as bigamy is legitimate, he had sworn to take care of them. And Hitha says, well, pitch a tent on the roof of the palace and go have sex with your father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. And uh, he does. Uh, uh, the counts, the counts of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if man had inquired at the oracle of God, not for its moral integrity, but for its piercing brilliance. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom, because what he's doing, he's driving a wedge so that no one can hope for reconciliation later. After this, reconciliation is impossible. There's and no also way. Also, it's it's him completely getting his revenge for his oh. granddaughter's defilement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But he doesn't have to be the one to dirty himself. It's, uh, yeah. we'll have uh, this guy do it. Yeah, he is, he's using, um, I think you just hit it. David used Bathsheba, he's using Absalom. He's manipulating Absalom, as well as tarnishing, uh, raping these, these poor girls who've been left behind. Well, having so that's done. The the division is sealed. There's no way either side can go back from this one. And uh, Ahithophel uh, now puts forward his counsel because again, absence. Wow, okay, did that. Before he could ask what next, Ahithophel tells him what's next. Let me now choose out twelve thousand men, and I will arise and pursue after David. I will come upon him while he. I'll come upon him when he's weary and weak handed, and will make him afraid. And all the people that are with him shall flee, and I will smite the king only. And I will bring back all the people unto thee and all the men whom thou seek. Uh, what is this? And I will bring back all the people unto thee. The man whom thou seekest is as if all returned. So all the people shall be at peace. He says, give me 12,000. I think that suggests probably he has in mind a thousand from each tribe. Share the guilt. Get everybody involved. So the Democracy. No tribe, yeah. So no tribe can say, hey, we had nothing to do. Let's get, let's get everybody involved, at least symbolically. And... Uh, I'll, I'll lead the strike force. None of this, and this is what you should do. I, give me command. I can do this. And his, his, he is very perceptive. All we need to do is take out David. We don't have to kill anybody else. No one Let's else needs to get hurt. Just David. And we'll go now before he has a chance to entrench himself anyplace. We'll go. We'll get him. And then it's all over. Because they'll have no shepherd, no leader, no king. And they'll, they're going to have to submit to the new order. So... That's that's it. This is, it needs to happen right away. David does not need any more time. Well, Absalom and the elders say, "Yeah, oh, that sounds really good." But Absalom says, "Well, let's let's talk to Hushai here. Let's see what he has to say." So Hushai has to think on his feet real fast. Uh, Ahithophel's response is real quick and pointed. Uh, Hushai kind of meanders for a while, and he spends a lot of time flattering a, um, <laughs> Absalom. He starts out by saying. Um, Oh, so that's the plan. Well, you know, uh, the council's not good at this time. For thou knowest uh, thy father and his men that they be mighty men. He's using, he's dropping in key words here, mighty men, that, that resonated. They be chafed in their minds as a bear robbed of her whelps in the field. Uh, again, more very, very clear re rhetoric here. My father is a man of war. He will not lodge with the people. So you're not going to get him. He won't be where you expect. So you attack, you may get some women and children, but he's going to be in some pit someplace. So that this isn't going to work. Behold, he is hit down in some pit or in, in some other place. And it will come to pass when some of them be overthrown at the first, because you're walking right into the Green Beret of Israel, or the <laughs> Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you're, you're, 
even if you outweigh them by thousands, there's going to be a slaughter up front from, from them. And people will be afraid. You know, when you, when you know what you're going up against, and sure enough, you walk right into a blender and blood's going everywhere, people, the psychological damage will be severe. People will run away and word will circulate that your followers have been routed. Uh, that's not good. That, we don't want that. They will say there's a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. And he that's valiant, whose heart is the heart of a lion, notice all these uh, animal images, shall utterly melt, for all Israel knoweth that thy father is a mighty man, and they which are with him are valiant men. Therefore, I counsel that all Israel be generally gathered unto thee from Dan to Beersheba, from the north to the south, as the sand that's by the sea for multitude, and that thou go to battle in thy own person. Let's make you the centerpiece in this strategy. So we shall come upon him in some place where he shall be found. We will light up among us the dew falleth on the ground, and of him and of all his men that are left there shall not be left so much as one. Moreover, if he be gotten into a city, then shall all Israel bring ropes to that city. We'll drag it to the river. You know, as a kid, I often wondered, wow, can cities really that do that? No, of course not. He's making the, He's just getting hyperbolic in his rhetoric here. Well, we'll grab ropes and drag the city to a river. <laughs> <laughs> until not a stone be found. And Absalom and all his elders say, the council of Hushai, the archite's better than that of the council of Hithabel. <laughs> For the Lord had appointed to defeat the good council of Hithabel. And Hushai sends messages by the priest's sons to go warn David. Meanwhile, Hithabel looks at this and says, huh, well, okay, we've lost. That was our one shot. He goes home, sets his affairs in order, and hangs himself. And the Psalms that describe the event are taken by the New Testament writers to be prophecies of Judas and his betrayal of the Lord's great Messiah. Yeah. Uh, we went to the house of God together. We had sweet fellowship, but let his office be taken by another. Well, the, the priest's sons reached David and warned him, and they managed to get across Jordan to a place where it's, they, can, they can dig in and get ready for a battle. They find a a city that will hold them. And then the, the battle commences, and, and I won't go through all the details of the battle except for this. The men who are with David are stronger and better than the militias of Israel, the professional soldiers, and God's blessed them. Uh, and there's a great battle. That's a triple threat. <laughs> yeah. So the people went out into the field against Israel. The battle was in the wood of Ephraim where the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David, there was a great slaughter that day of 20,000 men. The battle there was scattered over the face of the country, and the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. Every time I read that to my students, the wood devoured? Wait, what do we have, ins? Sure. Not it's not explained. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow. Well, I just, I think about how rough the footing is. Yeah, in a forest, if you're running in heavy armor, you, you're carrying you know an extra 30, 40 pounds of armor and, and a weapon as well, yeah. and your foot hits a you know a root that's sticking up from the yeah. dirt, <laughs> and you go headfirst into a tree with all that extra weight behind you. You're you're not gonna survive that. Yeah, and you just sit there and die slowly because blood oozes into your brain. And in the midst of we have one example of how the wood dealt a serious blow. Absalom decides to escape. And he's riding on his donkey, and he goes under the thick boughs of a great oak. Now, we're told earlier that he had very long hair. It's not clear whether it catches his hair, because he should have had a, a helmet on. But whether it catches his helmet or his hair, uh, he gets stuck in the boughs of the tree. And as the donkey goes away, he gets pulled off the donkey and lifted up in heaven. So here is the king's son hanging on a tree between heaven and earth. Oof. Joab's bearers see this and come and tell him and he goes and has them kill him and then he adds to it by the ten men that bear Joab's armor compassed him about and smote Absalom and slew him and uh, Joab himself threw a number three darts into Absalom's heart so he's dead as my girls would say D-E-D -E -D, dead he's <laughs> it's it's over uh, and the last little, uh, there's actually more that goes on beyond this, but one last little thing, um, seems little, but the text spends a lot of time with it. 
Joab now knows the war is over because it worked both ways. If Absalom dies, then the war is also over. He's dead. He needs to tell David. So he sends a messenger whose name is Cushai, which means black for whatever reason. And um, this, these are sad messengers. Apparently he was a mess messenger designated for bad news. We get uh, little prefix messages in our phone calls, like scam likely. <laughs> But my, my girls think, oh, it's Mr. Likely again. Scam, likely. Apparently, the messenger you sent was a tip off to the kind of message you would be getting. So if you saw the guy at a distance, you would know, you know, black sales, white sales. Black means it's not going to be so good. But there's one of the presets is there. Nehemiah's. He says, I want to go too. Well, you don't have any tidings. You're a good man. You bear good tidings. These are good tidings. So some other day. Yeah, but. And the other messenger takes off. Yeah, but I, I really want to go. You don't have anything. Well, just, yeah, but let me go anyway. All right, fine, go. So he goes and he outruns the other messenger and gets to David first. And when he bursts into the camp, the king says, is, is, is everything okay? And he says, all is well. The text, the English version says all is well. What he says is shalom, peace. And he announces that... Uh, the battle has been won. Well, David wants to know, is Absalom alive? And uh, uh, yes, avoids answering. <laughs> He's but not the, uh, entirely stupid. <laughs> yeah. The other runner shows up. And again, David asks, so is he alive? The enemies of my Lord, the king and all that rise up against thee to do thee hurt, be as that young man is. Yeah, he's dead. And the king is much moved and goes up and cries and weeps. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And poets have done a lot with that. But this, uh, this Ahimeas, he, uh, we run into him later. He marries one of Solomon's daughters. Oh. And he ministers in Zebulun and Naphtali, Galilee of the Gentiles. He's a priest who comes to bear witness that the war is over, that there is shalom, there is peace, because the king's son is dead, slain on a tree. And therefore Israel can be reunited. And he will, like the one whom he foreshadows, do a lot of priestly work and governing work in Galilee of the Gentiles. There's That's more. a really cool connection. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's, 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 you know, why does God put all this in? Why do we care about a foot race? Because <clears throat> there's more going on here. And, and we're, we're used to the positive images of Jesus. But we need to remember that when he died, he was the worst of sinners, not by his own sin but by that which was imputed to him. All the sins of the world, our sins, were placed upon him. In that moment, he died a sinner as Absalom died a sinner. I try to think, un unlike Absalom, he came back alive. Because Absalom's to think, sins well, were his own. When, there's a passage in the Old Testament where it specifically says, cursed be everyone who hangs on a tree. Yep. And I can't remember the original time because it was bef b before... That was Deuteronomy. It was Deuteronomy, Somewhere. thank you. Yeah. And Paul quotes it in Galatians. Yeah, but yeah, very much the point is this idea of hanging on a tree is you're, you're separated from heaven on the one hand and earth on the other. You are a person out of time and place. You are pulled away from all the solaces of everything. It is a sign of complete rejection. And on top of that, the tree is supposed to be man's life. And here it becomes man's death. So on all counts, it ain't a good thing. Yep. Things go, things continue to go bad because while David's pouting and trying to figure out how to get back, another another would-be usurper comes in. He has to be dealt with. There's fallout from that that's not so great. And then when David is on his deathbed, a fourth son revolts, and he has to be put down eventually by Solomon. So it's a long history of, that, that comes from, first of all, of course, David's own sin with Bathsheba, mm -hmm. and then by his failure to deal with the sins in his own family. We, we've seen in the last, oh, generation or so, a lot of emphasis in, in reform circles, in Presbyterian circles at least, and, and things that impinge on that. Uh, a renewed interest in the, the place of fathers, of leadership of men, patriarchy, sometimes it's called. There is a biblical doctrine of the headship of fathers and male leadership, but- um, Like anything. God, it can yeah. be taken to extremes. It can be taken to extremes. It can be corrupted. Uh, if you want to play that card, gentlemen, 
Again, God places a great deal of responsibility on you. If you're going to be a father, you don't just get the benefits. You just don't get to sit back with your, your beer and your cigar and talk theology or whatever while letting your house decay, letting your children go wild. You are responsible. And that's where it begins. Personal relationship with your kids, getting to know them, working with them, teaching them what I want, earning their respect, not assuming it, modeling the faith before them day after day, holding them accountable and letting them hold you accountable. Uh, it does not put you beyond the criticism of your wife and kids. A man steps up and owns that and says, I was wrong. I have sinned. I will, I will fix it. And if necessary, I will go public with my own sins. Mm. Uh, these, these, this is what male leadership is supposed to look like. And David failed. But, oh, 100%. <laughs> but in the crucial moment, he took upon himself the character of Christ. He took upon himself the judgment. Rather than blaming Absalom, although Absalom was certainly a fault, he leaves and accepts the exile and follows the path that Christ will eventually take over the Bochedron to the Mount of Olives and beyond in exile. And so in that, then God is finally ready to begin working with him. But even so, it's it's a long journey and there's no perfection. And there's no undoing what circumstances have set in motion. You know, we can be sorry for our sins and God can forgive us, but that does not automatically remove all the earthly consequences for what we mm -hmm. have begun. Uh, and it, it is well that we understand this and not pretend that grace simply wipes it all away. So, well, I told God I was sorry. That fixes everything, right? Nope. That Not sounds a lot like uh, whenever villains in TV shows or movies series turn good and immediately go oh, off yeah. and kill someone else and yeah. then <laughs> repent, so to speak. And mm -hmm. everyone goes, well, we have to accept that because she said she's sorry. Right. <laughs> it's like, you murdered 12 people, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's a, that's another thing we should talk about sometime with the, the, the modern existentialist idea of a hero because you define yourself moment by moment by your choices. Past choices are irrelevant if your current choices reject them. So you are who you are now. If right now you are choosing to do the good thing, then you're a good person now. Past is gone, the present's all that matters. I don't know how many TV shows I've seen where this kind of thing is happening, and you're absolutely right. Superhero movies, all kinds of things where, well, we'll just forget that you obliterated a planet in times past, but it's all right because you mean well now. This is not the biblical doctrine of repentance. Uh, biblical salvation comes because Jesus bore our sin. He bore our penalty. The penalty was not washed away. It wasn't that God's love just so overwhelmed the situation that he could do without his justice. God executed his justice against his own son. And therein is our salvation. But in the meantime, within history, there is still the matter of discipline and consequence and growth. We need Sometimes to be spanked, we need to be disciplined, we need to be chastened. It's to be better partakers of his holiness that Jesus has served for us. Amen. Well, I think that's uh, the perfect place to wrap up then. Uh, we'll move on to recommendations. Greg, do you have anything? Uh, I recommend sacred concerts for teenagers. Now, my kids, as most of you know, have gone through Christian school. They're they're out and beyond and moving into other things, but I'm still a Christian school teacher. And a bunch of my students uh, last night went to uh, a music hall performance put on by an organization of Christian schools. We've been doing this on and off for years as a school, and it, it always presents some problems. Okay, is everybody going? Just the choir? How many people in the choir? It, it creates some logistic nightmares on occasion, but it's worth it. Because here, our kids get to go and, and rub shoulders with other kids who probably have more intense formal choir um, programs than we do. Ours, do. Is a, ours is a small, <laughs> yeah, they do. Ours is a small school with a wonderful director who works well with them, but he has a million other things to do, most of which are not choir. And and our, we require choir. Um, there, were, there was a point in planning out our future curriculum where we had to look at um, what the USC schools were requiring and they wanted a fine arts requirement. We either said, well, it can be drama or it can be choir. And for a number of reasons, um, I said, no, it shouldn't be drama. Some of those reasons were selfish, but one of them was, was positive. And, you know, God commands his people to sing. He never mm -hmm. commands them to act. <laughs> um, singing is a divine appointment. 
divine responsibility and privilege. And so every one of our kids should have some, some instruction in singing. And so to have these kids go through this, be in choir, not because they earned it by some kind of contest, but because it's a responsibility before God to learn to sing. And then go and hang out with kids who are more privileged, who do have more training, who probably did earn a place in the honors choir, and be exposed to all sorts of music, not just yeah. the pop stuff they hear on the radio, but classical and jazz and uh, gospel, uh, black spirituals, all of that. And, and to hear it in the mouths of other kids their own ages who come from different backgrounds and different experiences, I think it's a very wonderful thing. It also puts a huge responsibility on the people who organize this because this can be done as a, a sacred concert, a, a worship service, or it can be turned into uh, an entertainment display. And that's not on the kids, that's on the, the directors and the organizers. And it's sometimes it's a hard thing because our kids maybe don't, have a category for, for sacred concert. Mm. And some of these directors don't seem to either. So, <laughs> and yet, yet, we went last night. It was a wonderful thing to hear God praised by a whole bunch of teenagers all singing together because all the choirs in the end are brought together and everybody sings. So I, you went you went to music college, didn't you? I think all the years I was in choir, yeah. Yeah. I, mean, you, I really, I really remember the first one. Like that one still sticks in my head just because... Uh, it was, I, I guess, honestly, the first one always just like of anything yeah. sticks yeah. in our head yeah. more. But I was just remembering the the song that we did. We all came back together and sang was this beautiful arrangement by Haydn of the heavens are telling the glory of God. Mm. Yeah. And I remember there's a part they they ended up picking soloists, and I still bitter i was not chosen but um <laughs> not really still bitter it's just I, I just remembered it now for the first time in however many years and uh this beautiful inner interweaving bit of soloistic work for each mm -hmm. voice saying um the day that is coming speaks uh the day or newer translations put it like uh day to day pours forth speech and night to night right. reveals knowledge uh and it was not – no one in that choir knew what that meant is what I'm saying, <laughs> is what I'm getting at. But it's a very it's a very beautiful, beautiful uh -huh. piece. Okay. Well, there's my recommendation. What's yours? Uh, mine, oddly enough, actually ties in uh, at least referentially to what, what you were talking about. Uh, there is a wonderful choral piece by the composer Eric Whitaker, um, which I first heard at that first – Musical. Uh, it's a much shorter version because the full version of this piece is 18 minutes or 21 minutes long. Ooh. And it is that text. When David heard that Absalom was slain, he went into mm. his chambers and wept mm. for 21 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, oddly enough, probably uh, tracks what it felt like <laughs> for, for David yeah. for his uh, attendance and all that. But it is gorgeous. It is it is an intensely beautiful piece of music, and it it is written like someone weeping. Mm. It's not, oh no, my son. For twenty one minutes, there are significant length portions in the center and uh, that repeat throughout, where it's a lot quieter, mm. and it's my son, my son, my son, my son. <laughs> And then it goes back into wailing because that's what happens when you're in mm -hmm. grief is that yeah. it, you, it's not static or it's not always dynamic. There is right. this roller coaster and loop de loos right. that you go through when you're grieving. And I, I that piece just captures it perfectly. So that is my recommendation. It also ties into the fact that we were talking about Absalom. So Ooh, yeah. beautiful, beautiful piece. And with that, I think we'll uh, call this a wrap. Thank you all so much for listening. If you would like to follow us, you can do so on YouTube, on Rumble. You can follow our Facebook page. Uh, and if you want to subscribe to us and catch all future episodes, catch up on the backlog, you can do that through any podcast catcher that you can name. I believe we're on every single one. I think they all use like one of three sources from like the <laughs> RSS feed. So if you have one and we're not on there, let us know at our email, 
uh, which is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. If you have thoughts uh, about what we've talked about today or on previous episodes, uh, if you have questions for us that you would like us to answer, you can email us there and uh, we will gladly read those. You can also support us at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. And we do very heartily from the bottom of our hearts, heartfully thank those people who have uh, decided to support us financially. Uh, it helps us keep things running and subscriptions to uh, different digital services and software that help us uh, edit these to a listenable form. Well, thank you so much again for joining us for this discussion, and we will see you next time. Thank you.